plus down over square root of two. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the goal is to do quantum computing. And so we want to do quantum stable, like this one, qubits. Where this Q stands for quantum bits. Okay, so I don't, okay, I repeated quantum class. Okay. So that's the, the idea. Try to develop a model that's robust, like a magnet is, that allows us to do computations with quantum bits. To superpose bits, apply operations on bits, that. Uh, Flip 0 to 1, that allows us to write linear combinations of bits, and so on. And so, Kitaya makes a proposal for a 2G qubit realization. <coughs> and here is the, more ge the most general proposal that he makes. He says that if you want to realize 2G qubits, <coughs> do the following. Consider some surface of genus G. Okay, so consider some surface of genus G. So this is a sphere. But let's suppose we are doing a torus. Maybe genus 2. Doesn't matter some surface of genus G. So we start with some sigma, some surface with, in this case, two holes, if we want to describe a state with four qubits. Then, uh, on this surface, put some lattice on this surface. So here I'm putting some lattice on the surface. So I'm drawing first the rows, then I'll draw the columns. So this would be an example. And now I would draw the lattice, for example, like this. So you see that I have some, some grid on this surface. It doesn't need to be regular at all. It could be like this, there could be even some faces that are triangles instead of uh, there could be some faces that are pentagons yeah, some lattice regular or not like I said it could be some lattice like this again some triangles something like this you just put a lattice on your genus G surface okay now, on this lattice, you define two types of operators. One, so, okay, we have this lattice, and then uh, there is a spin that can be up or down at each edge. The spins live on edges, not on, uh, on the vertices. So to a vertex, I associate an operator that will be a product of spins on all the edges that come to that vertex. So it's a product of four spins if the valence is four, but if the valence is three, it would be a product of the three spins that live on the three neighboring edges. So this defines an operator called the star operator. A that is defined on a vertex, which is defined as the product of the Pauli matrix sigma x acting on J, where J belongs to the star, star that come out of that vertex. Okay, in this case, a four-point star, a three-point star, and so on. Okay, is it clear? 
the definition of this. It's a local term that just acts locally around a given vertex. Then uh, we define an operator that's associated to the face that is a product of the spins that surround the face. So that's another type of operator that given a face, again the face could be a rectangle for example, but it could also be a triangle. You define B associated to some face to be the product of J belonging to the fa to the ba uh, to the boundary of that face of the Pauli matrix sigma Z along the boundary. Okay? So one is sigma Z, one is sigma X. I remind you, sigma X in the standard realization is this and sigma z in the standard realization would be this. Sorry, what is star that you wrote there? Star for a vertex means that if I have a given vertex, it's all the spins that come out of the vertex. So for a given vertex of latency of, uh, of adjacency 4, it's the product of these four spins. So let's see what it does, what these operators do. Suppose I am in this basis, this canonical basis, where this is up, this is down, this is up, this is down. So we always work in this basis. So sigma x, you see, it sends a down spin, it flips down and up, right? It's a not diagonal matrix. So this A, we can say that A, this operator A, flips spins, flips, spins, at the star, right? So if you have some star configuration, if the spin was up, 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 after acting with A, it's down, 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 down. Because it's a product, so it flips all of them. If it's up, 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 down, it becomes down, 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 up, right? Because you product over everyone, so you flip everyone. This guy, instead, if you have a fixed configuration, it measures. If it's up, it gives 1. If it's down, it gives minus 1. So that one flips, and this one measures, if you want, the parity at a face. So if everyone is up, it gives the same state. If, ever, if there are an even number of up and an even number of down, it also gives one. So it just cares about counting how many up and how many down up to uh, parity. Right? Well, everyone, 4 minus is the same as 4 plus, but 3 plus and 1 minus is it. Right? So it counts up to parity. So we have these two operators. On this, and now, these are two operators we could define. Now we are ready to define a physical model, so we define now an Hamiltonian, which will be equal to the sum over all vertices, 1 minus A at that vertex, plus the sum over all faces, 1 minus B of that face. And that's the definition of our Hamiltonian. Okay, so we sum over all the vertices and all the faces in a given genus G surface and we get this. The operator is attached to the vertex. The definition of the operator is that I multiply the edges. The spins are at the edge. Don't produce edges with the spins live at the edge. They don't live at the vertex. So when you have a vertex, the A star is a product of the spins at the edges that connect to that vertex. Okay, sounds, sounds good? This is the definition of the Hamiltonian. And the claim 
is that this system realizes this. It's a 2G qubit system. Namely, the claim, the analog of this statement on the left, let's write it, is that this Hamiltonian, so the claim, is that H acting on Psi equal 0 times Psi is the ground state. The ground state has zero energy. And moreover, there are many ground states, so you can have an index i, i, and i, there are a few ground states, runs from 1 to the power 2, to the 2g. Right? In other words, the dimension of the states psi corresponding to ground states is 2 to the 2g, as we would expect for a 2g qubit system, where I have 2g qubits, each of them can be plus or minus. So the ground state, they are degenerate. So the spectrum will be that there will be a bunch of states at e equals 0, all degenerate. Then there is a gap. We will see, and then there are many states here and so on. We don't care what happens here. We will see that this gap is bigger than 2 in the unit we are using. It's in fact more or less 4. But OK, there is a gap. And that means that if you cool down the system, you stay in this subspace. Even for the hard drive that we were describing before, it's important to cool down the system. Otherwise, thermal fluctuations are too big, and that majority mechanism doesn't work. So here, if we cool down, we stay here. But to be robust, we don't want just to stay here. We want this degeneracy to remain exact. We don't want it to open and so on. Because we want to be able to do manipulations and stay within that subspace and be able to mix 0 with 1 with, and to be able to have degeneracy exact. And the statement is indeed that the splitting of the E equals 0 energies, the way they split when under perturbations, you take your system and do some perturbation to it, and we'll describe this in a second, that this splitting is exponentially suppressed and it's e to the minus a times l where l is the length of the minimal cycle in the Riemann circuit. So if, you're, if all your cycles, if all your non-contractible cycles, if they are reasonably big, then this is irrelevant, and this is very, very small. OK? So, so is it clear? So this would be one cycle. For example, this maybe has 20 sites. This would be another cycle. Maybe this one has 20 sites as well. Then each of them would be e to the minus 20. It's super suppressed. But maybe this cycle is very small, then this would be what we would have to worry about. But if you put some torus with some two big cycles, then you are safe. The degeneracy is not broken, and so you get some very, very tiny degeneracy, and that means that this is stable. That for all practical purposes, you do have degenerate ground states. Yeah? Yes. Right. Otherwise, you couldn't superpose them and make linear combinations and so on. Good. Um, excellent. So that's the statement. Uh, and uh, 
Okay, and now the idea that I, I, like, I will explain this why this statement is true. But is the statement clear? It's, very, it's a very interesting statement in the sense that it's very important to emphasize the fault. You have a gap. So having a gap means, for example, that correlation functions, say sigma at some position, at some edge i, sigma at some edge i plus l, where l means some distance away from that edge. So take two edges that are separated by 30 sites. Then uh, this scales as e to the minus some gap times l. They are exponentially small. That's what the gap gives you, right? So things decay exponentially. So you think that there's no local, nothing interesting is happening, right? You just have a gap, the vacuum would be boring, and things would decay exponentially. And yet, that's not true. Because the system knows somehow about the genus of the surface it's in. So if you have some very big torus with genus 5, there are 2 to the uh, 10 uh, vacuum, even though locally all correlations decay and locally everything is totally boring. And so the, the idea is that there is some order, there is some property of the vacuum that's topological that is very robust. And that order, so yet we have this many vacuum that depend on the genus G. And this idea is what is called topological uh, order. People normally say quantum topological order. It's this idea that uh, there is some order that's very robust and that's topological, even though there are no, uh, everything is gapped and there are no long range effects. So it's a contradiction to the usual law that we say when you have an RG flow, either you flow to a CFT or you flow to some boring gap theory. Uh, that's strictly speaking not true. You could also flow to an interesting topological theory, as uh, in this case. So it's another possible endpoint of RG flow that if you study the wrong books, don't learn about. It. Okay. So this is the statement. Let's apply, let's study this statement and this proposal for the simplest possible uh, case of just doing a genus a G equal 1, so a torus. Okay, so let's apply this for a torus. <coughs> Can I raise this top part? No. Okay. So let's apply it for a torus. So let's draw the torus. So the torus would be something like this. I just have a square lattice. I'll apply it for a regular torus, but it will become clear. And you see that this line is identified here. So if I go here, I come here. That's why it's a torus. And so the spins are on edges. So remember, very important, there is a spin here. The spin is here. It's not at the cusps. It's at, at each edge there is a spin. So this edge I only drew once. That's why I avoided drawing it twice. There is a spin on this edge that couples from this vertex to this vertex here. Okay, but now each edge is drawn only once and I drew here as many edges as there are spins. So if this dimension is k, and if here there are k lines as well, then you see that there are two k square spins. That means there are k square vertex, and each vertex has two edges that are new coming out. OK, so you can easily see there are two, two, two k square edges. <coughs> and now <coughs> we have these operators. The B operator is an operator associated to a face, and it's the product of 
this would be a B operator, a product of sigma z here. And then A operator, you take a vertex and you multiply along the vertex. Let me get some colors. Let me use this yellow for the A. So A acts on a vertex and flips the spins at these four edges. And B measures the parity on these four edges. Right? So B, for example, if it's up, 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 B gives one. And A here, if it's up, 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 it becomes minus, 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 minus after you act with A. Okay? Good. So the first thing we see immediately is that, and then our Hamiltonian is this. So first, a very important observation is that B square equal a square equal to 1. That's obvious from the definition, right? Because remember, A flips everything. If you flip twice, you do nothing. B measures something that is plus or minus 1. If you measure twice, you get 1. Okay? And so that means that B, the eigenvalues of B are plus minus 1. The eigenvalues of A are plus minus 1. Right? Also, A and B commute. B for any phase commute with A for any vertex. Why? Because suppose I'm measuring the parity of a given square. If I act with A before measuring, it doesn't matter because either A is far away and then it doesn't matter. Or if A is nearby, A can flip two of the sides. But if you flip two of the sides, the parity is the same. See? So the only dangerous thing is if B was this, and A was this, but you see, if you act with A first, you change everyone, then you measure B. If you measure B first and then act A, it will be the same thing. It will end up flipping these edges, that's true, and then measuring B or vice versa, so it clearly commutes. So these guys commute with each other, and so the Hamiltonian, the ground state will be when all A's are equal to 1 and all B's are equal to 1. And we can generalize them simultaneously because they all commute. And so the ground state is when this guy is equal to 1, this guy is equal to 1, and that is the ground state. Now, what would be an excited state? Well, at least one of these guys cannot be 1. If you flip from 1 to minus 1, you gain energy equal to 2, because 1 minus minus 1 is 2. So that's where I wrote there 2. But we will see that actually you need to have 2 at the same time, and therefore it will be 4. But we see that there are zero. Okay. And so, for the ground state, we have that A, any A, acting on, the gra on any ground state, is equal to any B, acting on any of the ground states, equal to the ground state. Okay. OK, so B, I forgot to label here, this is A. B and A act on the ground state. Now we have many conditions for B and many conditions for A. So you could think that imposing all these conditions could completely give you a unique ground state. Then it would not be degenerate. But it is degenerate. And it is degenerate, why? Because these A's and B's, they are not all independent. So even if you impose all these conditions, you don't fix the ground state completely. Namely, notice that the product over all A's is equal to the product over all B's, and that's equal to 1. <coughs> Why? Because if you multiply all B's, you are multiplying, for example, this B with the neighboring B. But then, then you count the parity of this line twice. And so on. So when you multiply everyone, each edge appears twice, and therefore you get one. Okay? If you want to see it algebraically, you just remember that sigma x square is the identity. And sigma x will appear twice every time. Same for A. You flip everything here, but you also flip everything in the neighbor, so you flip this guy twice, you do nothing here. 
And if you multiply over everyone, you see that each edge is being flipped twice, so not, you do nothing, and so a, multiplying over all A's is 1. And that means that these conditions, that we don't have as many as we would think, we don't have 2k square conditions, we have 2k square conditions minus 2. And because of this minus 2, that means that instead of freezing all the 2q square qubits, now we are left at the end with 2 qubits. Because we don't freeze everything. So imagine I have a lattice and I say sigma z acting on side i is 1 for all i's. Then I freeze everything. Everything must be up. But I do it n squared times except in a corner. Okay, then that corner is free. If that corner has 5 spins, then I have a 5 qubit system. Okay, so I just count how many things are still free. So that means there are 2 qubits that should be free. And so the space of the ground states as dimension 4. So this proxy condition, we should read it as applying every <coughs> for every star and every different space. And the ground state Here? configuration of no, no, no. Here? Yeah. For each star, this is, and for each Phase, this is true. Okay, and the ground state would be a configuration for the whole edge, for the spins in the whole edge. That's right. The ground state is a combination of spins over all edges, and the ground state must have the property that you take your combination of spins everywhere, you act with A, you get back the state. You act with B, you get back the state for any A and B. And so the ground state energy is zero because it's a sum of many zeros. Zero, 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 zero. Many zeros that add up to zero. You see, it's a bit like saying the ground state, let me write another Hamiltonian that's also zero, the spectrum, which would be the sum of just some sigma z at position j, and I sum over j. Again, here, okay, this. This one also has energy zero. All spins like to be pointing up. But it's totally boring. It's just uh, the ground state is just a product of all spins up, and there's nothing particularly interesting here. You put this on the genus G, you get still all are up. There's only one vacuum, it's everyone up. There's nothing topological, this, all the spins become decoupled. No spins talk to no spins. And there's no such statement as, uh, yeah. <coughs> so this would be a case where it will be gapped and boring. The case we are describing is, uh, so here, there is no degeneracy. They also commute with each other. The ground state is a sum of zeros as well, but it's not an interesting sum of zeros like here. Yeah? Can you repeat why there's this minus two? We have two k square minus two conditions. Naively, if I count there are k square of these guys, k square of these guys, so there will be two k square conditions. But they are not independent. If you impose all of them except one, the last one is automatic because the product of all of them is one. Right? So the last A, you don't need to check. If you already checked that A everywhere except the last one is one, the last one is automatic because this property is always true. It's, a topol it's just a, true st a trivial statement. For the B's as well, you check that all faces give one, the last face you don't need to check. That's automatic. Okay. Yeah. At this point, it's not obvious that you can have like a third operator that saturates the, 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 the it gives you enough to fix the whole class, right? Because if you have, for example, a third operator that that could, in principle, fix the remaining two, or is that not? <coughs> Now we will construct this space. So by constructing this space, we remove any possible question about whether the space could be smaller because we'll construct it. Okay. So let's construct explicitly this state of two qubits. How do they look like explicitly? 
Okay. So now we have this dimension for subspace. We want to think of it as two qubits, where we will have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Right? So let's now construct explicitly what these guys are. <coughs> so like we said before, when I multiply B operators, I multiply a bunch of B operators like this. What do I get if I multiply these B operators? Well, I'm, I have product of sigma Z on each line, but this appears twice, I can remove, this appears twice, I can remove, right? So we get an operator that would be like this kind of shape. Right? <coughs> Where this operator here, I define it like this. I say I have a contour C. And then this operator would be a product over the edges that belong to this contour C of sigma ZJ. So this would be a definition of an operator of type Z for a given contour C. And our B operator is nothing but this type of operator, more general one, defined on the tiniest possible contour, where C is just a single plaquette. But more generally, we could define this operator. Notice that if C is a closed contractible loop, Z acting on any of these elements of the ground state is equal to the same. They act trivially on the ground state because we just saw that they are product of V's and each V gives one. Right? So this object, these closed loops, are act trivially, they just act and they, they are not interesting as operators to manipulate my ground state. I can create these loops, but I act and they do nothing. I can also define a product when I have my lattice. I can define a loop that goes like this. You see, it connects edges. I can define a, a different type of loop. You see that it doesn't go along the line, but from mid edge to mid edge. Let's call this C prime. And the definition is such that whenever you cross uh, an edge, you do consider the spin that passes that edge. So let's see. So let me draw the, the contour C prime in yellow, hitting it strong. So this is the contour, and now I want to say that this operator is a product of the sigma z, no, of the sigma x on the lines that cross this contour. You see? Each line that the contour crossed, I consider sigma z there. So this operator acts on a given cut contour C prime would be defined as the product of the sigma J X now on the on C prime, where you understand what I mean by that, right? It's the edges that C prime crosses. And again, this operator, our operator A, is nothing but this operator X for the smallest possible such dual contour which just goes around the cusp. It just goes around one of the vertices. Right? Then this is our operator A. And the same story if C prime is a closed contractible loop, 
acts on the state, gives back the state. Because again, this C prime, I can get it by multiplying all the stars inside this region. If you multiply all the stars, you see that inside many lines appear twice, you don't care, you just care about the boundary. Right? So if you multiply two stars, for example, the middle one you don't care, you care about the ones in the bottom. Okay, so we just constructed operators that are boring. But this immediately leads us to understand that what was crucial was that these were contractable. Because they were contractable, we could get them by just multiplying trivial things. But now that we have a torus, we could imagine the non-contractable ones, where I make the contours wrap the torus, and now they cannot be contracted. Okay, so now we could define on the torus we can take the torus and define two operators that are going to be axes, so there are going to be two contours that are one contour is this you see this is a closed contour on the torus the other closed contour on the torus could be for example this another closed contour on the torus. So, to this line, uh, to this guy, I would associate uh, an operator X that I call X1. This, I have an operator of type X that I call X2. And I can also define non-contractable operators like this. This will define a Z operator that I call Z2. And I could define this operator here that I call Z1. And notice that there is no typo. I wrote vertical ones, I call them Z1 and X2. And horizontal ones, I decided to call it X1 and Z2. It's my choice. But it's not a typo, it's correct. OK, so we define these operators. And now the claim is that these operators act non-trivially on these vacuum states. Okay? The claim is that these operators here, they define these four operators here. So the claim is that these four operators move us in the I space. Well, they are like our buttons of the quantum computer that allows us to go between the various states. So, act, click a button, pack, it means push, multiply by x1. Click another button, multiply by x2. And these four buttons that we have move us in this I space. Okay, let's try to, really to understand why that's the case and how it works. So, let's try to construct. Um, <coughs> Let me see if I want to make a few comments about this. Okay, uh, no. I don't need to make these comments, that's good. Okay, so let's try to construct this uh, ground state uh, very explicitly. <coughs> so, Let's construct one configuration first of spins that has that all b's are equal to one. Let's first start with that. Just, I just want one configuration of spins on my torus where everyone is one. So let's try to guess the form of those four states. So let's start with one state that obeys that all b's are equal to one. So Let's do it. So 
So let's use the following notation. Line without anything means I put the spin up there. Line with a ball means that I put the spin down there. Now the claim is that this clearly has all b is equal to 1. Obviously, right? You just measure b here, all up, all up, all up, all up, all up. That's clearly a state that has all spins equal to 1. Notice that <coughs> this state, if you act with um, If you act with Z on this state, on uh, this guy here, Z on this, with this Z1 or Z2, so Z1 acting on this state would be gi will give it me the state again, and Z2 acting on this state will give me the state again. It's true for this particular state. Now, why is this true? Because you see Z1, the Z operator, measures the Bs along the contour. And everyone is up. So, of course, the Bs along this contour give 1. And the Bs along, where was the other contour? This contour here give 1. Because they are all just 1. Right? But there is another possibility of getting one. So now I'm going to start deforming this picture. It's not going to be easy to take notes. I apologize. So now I'm going to say, suppose I want to put here two. OK, good. Now let's do different. OK. Any, do you agree with this statement here? OK. Now, is this a ground state? So this has this property and B acting on omega, any B is equal to omega. That's good. But what fails, obviously? A. Right? If you act with A, for example, on this edge, let's act with A on A here. What do you get? You get four spins here. Right? So it's not invariant under A. OK. So now I'll fix the state to make it invariant under that A. I will say the state is the original one. It's this one plus this one. Now it works. If I act with A here, I get this. If I act with A here, I erase the, the balls. So it works for that A. But I need to make it work for all A's. So I need to sum over all possible states. There will be many, many states. And if I sum over all possible states like this, I will generate a, something that will automatically be an eigenstate of all A's. Right? But those states, they have something in common. They never change Z1. Because you see that, let's try to change the value of Z. Act with an A here. You put an excitation here, 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 and here. That doesn't change the parity of this line because you put two excitations. So you cannot put just one excitation. You need to put two at least. Right? You can try, you cannot do it. You can try to change the parity of this line. You want to put an excitation here, say by acting with an excitation here. That puts excitations here, 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 and here. But it puts two. Okay? So, this state like this, the full thing that we would write, would have this property. Z1 and Z2 would be this. So this Z1 acting on omega Z, this would be one of the states, and this is topologically stable. 
I have all these states, I never change it. So let's write down explicitly the form of omega so that it's not a picture. Let's write an equation for this. So we would say omega is the following. The omega that we have there is the following. We have a state where we have z1 up to zn, where this notation indicates <coughs> all the possible z's in a, that I have. I can label this one to be z1, z2, z3, z4, z5. I don't know how you want to call it. Z, z, z. All the z's here. And there are z small n, where this n is 2k squared. <coughs> Okay? And we have this this, given a state like this, give me, uh, tells me the spin at each edge. What do, this, uh, what do I do with this state? Well, I take this state and I sum over all these choices of zj, but not totally fixed, such that two things happen. One, is that the sum of the values zj when j is in the contour of z1 is equal to 0, mod 2. The sum when j is in the contour z2 of this zj is equal to 0, mod 2. And finally, the sum of the zj's is equal to 0 mod 2 in each phase. So, for example, the configuration we said before, where everyone is up except these four guys, clearly does the job. The z's here add up to 0, the z's here add up to 0. Right? And here the face is okay, here the face is okay, here the face is okay, here the face is okay. And then uh, what's very important is that we do this sum and they all come with the same coefficient. That's super important. And this is because we need that A acting on omega gives me omega for any star. And so, the stars will relate two different terms of the sum, so they better be that each term comes with the same coefficient 1, like this and this were the same coefficient. Okay, so well, how many terms there are, when you, if you want to normalize the state correctly? Well, you see, imagine you fix all, how many terms are, how many ways are there to choose, for example, that all spins add up to 0 mod 2? Well, you can choose the first, the second, the third, you can choose every one, but then the last one is fixed for you. And then, how many ways are there once you fix the boundary to fill in inside? Well, you go here, and you see, you have two choices here, only, because, for example, if here it's up, up, you can only put up, up, or down, down. So at each phase, you only have two options. You don't have four options. And so you have two options per phase, and so on, you do some counting, and you see that you get one over two to the k square minus one options, and so you normalize it like this, so that this state is orthonormal. So that's the definition of the vacuum state, mm -hmm. one of the vacuum states. And now you see immediately what's the definition of, this would be the definition of 0, 0. What we just did. How would you do 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1? Well, you just change here. If instead of imposing these conditions, you would put 1, 1, that would be the state 1, 1. If you put 0, 1, you get 0, 1. If you put 1, 0, you get 1, 0. And so here is the construction of the four states. Let's look at the 1, 0, or at, at one of the other ones. Let's look at the 1, 0 state. To see how different it is from the 0, 0. <coughs> ah, okay. Yeah, good. No, uh, yeah, let's do it. Okay. 
So, let's try to look at what could be a configuration where everyone is up, but there is one down here, an odd one. Right? Okay. How do I get a configuration that works like this? So I fix, sorry, the lines are here and here. So let's imagine that this line, there is one guy that's odd. Okay? So Z1 as odd, now instead of even. So this would be the case where here I would put a 1 and here I keep a 0. So I want to describe the other qubit 1, 0 instead of 0, 0. So let's see. Is this a good state from the point of view of B? Does it have the B equal 1 at all faces? This one is good, this one is good, but can you spot this one is not good, right? So what could you do to fix this phase? The simplest option. You want to put another, another spin. Where? Here, 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 where do you want? Opposed to it? That was one option. Just for future reference, let me re remember that there was another option, which was here. But OK, we chose this one. Now we have this one. Now this face is good. This face is also good. This face is also good. What about this face? That's not good. So what do we need to do to go to this face, to fix this face? Another one, where do you want to put it? Here? OK. And now, go on, please. Now put the next one. Now this one is good. Now this one is bad. Put another one. And now everyone is good. But you see what you have to do? You have to put this operator here. OK? So you have to act with a full line of, of things here. Now, another option, like you said, was this. You could do this, this, and you can easily see that if you, you could put a, a spin like this, you could also put one like here, one here, one here, one here. This would also be a good state. And both have two string-like objects, but the strings are topologically the same, but they are different kind of strings. <laughs> and so, notice that, uh, this operator here is not the same as the operator x1, right? It's not. We can call this operator x1 up. Up because it's like x1, but it's up here. Okay? This operator here, we could call this operator, an operator corresponding to this line picture, x1, I don't know, up and deformed. Right? But you see that the difference between x1 and this is a bunch of star operations. Because if you act with stars here in the middle, you effectively move them up. But the stars are one. So these operators are topological. All that matters is what they connect. You can move them around at no cost. So even though, so what we see, what we learn here is that uh, the state 1, 0, actually, you can get it from the state 0, 0 if you act with operator x1, but you could also get it from the state 0, 0 if you act on 0, 0 with a state x1 deformed up, because the difference between these two operations is just a bunch of stars. So this operation, this operator x1 and x1 up, they are different operators. But acting on this vacuum, they act as topological operators. So they really are different operators. One multiplies of spins here, one multiplies spins here. If you are an experimentalist, it matters. In one case you are here, in the other case you are here. But you act on the state and you get the same thing. And you don't even need to act here. You can be drunk, you can act whatever you want. <laughs> Provided you act on the torus correctly, the result is the same. It's also the same as x1 up and drunk x1 and back on this zero zero. All in 
know, we conclude that we can in this way define a vacuum. We just define a vacuum. We define four vacuum, and they have the following properties. So now we have this vacuum here, zero, zero, and I'm going to write a few properties. For example, acting on x1 on zero, zero, gives one, zero. If you acted with x2 on 0, 0, you would get 0, 1. If you act with both x1, x2 on 0, 0, you would get 1, 1. If you act, for example, with z1 on 0, 0, like we said, you get 0, 0. If you act with z1, on one zero you get minus one zero let's look at this one why is this true because now you see that we have this string here so whenever i measure whenever i ask z and i measure the spins along uh, right uh, So I act with x1, good. If I measure the spins Apologies. Ah, good, good, good. Ah, this was confusing. It's because we have to be careful that the edges of the lattice this is not an edge of the lattice, right? Remember, this is a, I was kind of, yeah. So, so if I measure the, but the ball is this edge here, right? Be careful. At the line of the the edges are here. So you see now that if I measure the spin in any vertical line here, I get an odd number. And so I get minus 1 instead of plus 1 like before. So I get this minus sign here. Well, but then uh, you see from all these properties that you could go on, you conclude that these operators, Z1, acts really like the operator sigma z acting on site 1, z2 is nothing but the operator sigma z acting on site 2, and x1 is nothing but the operator sigma x acting on site 1, and sigma 2 is nothing but the operator sigma x acting on qubit 2. So we constructed our quantum computer where these operations of acting with sigma plus and sigma z are acted by these topological operators here. Okay, that's cool. Now, let's imagine, so, so that's it about the vacuum. Is everything clear? Now let's ask how stable this is. Now the real world, the Hamiltonian, is equal to the Hamiltonian we just described, that people call the toric code. Good to know when people talk about the toric code, they talk about this Hamiltonian. We will hear it in many colloquia. But now imagine we do some perturbations. For example, we can have some sum of some random perturbations. The real Hamiltonian that your experimental is here, some garbage. And then sigma i dot sigma j, for example, where this i and j are some neighbors. So for example, maybe the neighbor, the first four neighbors here. <coughs> If i and j are separated by 4, there is some small garbage. And you want to ask, so we have some v garbage. How does this picture change? How robust are these states? Right? Is 0, 0, we have these beautiful four states, orthogonal to each other, right? Uh, obviously, uh, they have different eigenvalues of z's, and so they are obviously orthogonal to each other. And what happens now? So now, suppose we have this Hamiltonian. We have a gap. So we would like to do perturbation theory to study the splitting of these energy levels. So now I want to ask, for example, things like 0, 0. How does it start mixing with 0, 1? By perturbing it with this interaction Hamiltonian. And suppose we are doing it at n order in perturbation theory, so something to the power n. I want to compute things like this. 
And the claim is that this stuff is zero. Unless n is very big, let's see why. Because you see that if you have your spin chain and you act with an operator that changes this stuff here, right? If it changes the stuff here, how is it going to change the parity of a full line that goes here? Right? It cannot. Even, now what about this line? No, this line it could. It could change these signs and it could, it's very easy to change this line. But not this one. Right? Or, or this one, or this one. So the first order in perturbation theory, there's no way this state with some parity is going to be not orthogonal to a state that has a different parity. So you would need, for example, second order perturbation theory, third order perturbation theory, many order perturbation theory, until the perturbation theory is such that you can affect a full cycle. Right? And so you need this n to be of order of the smallest possible cycle you could have. That's where the smallest cycle comes in. And therefore, this object, you need to really, this is a small effect, you have small effect to the power L, so this is really e to the minus A times L. Right? Each in, each in. And so it's very robust. You do a small perturbation, the states don't care, they are still orthogonal to each other, it's still a four dimensional vacuum with four states. So this Hamiltonian, so it's super powerful. It's an Hamiltonian that's local. All we needed to do is use local operations to construct it, right? It's A's and B's. And it's robust to any type of deformation, with any kind of symmetry. It, it doesn't matter. It's very, very robust. And you deform if you have some small impurities. The lattice is not regular, whatever. doesn't matter. It's the, the, you still get nicely for the generate ground states that you can use to do quantum computation. Now, what time is it? Too far. Okay. I'm almost done. So now, what, when do we get in physics in quantum field theory e to the minus something times length? When we have a massive particle, and the massive particle propagates for some length l, and, it's, and there is some exponential decay, and we get some exponential effect. So this looks like saying that we have our torus, right? Can it be that in, in the field, the continuum limits, can I think that there are some gapped particles? And these gapped particles, there are virtual particles that travel around, and then they will propagate and then annihilate, and, and they will tell us about the minimal cycles. They will be flying around, and they will give corrections that will be proportional to the cycle. Okay, so that would be an explanation for this, which we just derived mathematically, we don't need an explanation. But we would like to see this, so to see particles, now we go to the next step, which is we describe excitation around the vacuum. Now we don't want vacuum, we want excitations. Excitations are particles. So let's define excitations on this model. So let's go, so vacuum, it's done, so this would be, so here we would be, um, uh, right now I'm starting section two, so this would be up to page five, that's it, and now we have two more pages to conclude, which would be excitations. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Now, so, the idea of these expectations is the following. So now we will have a star equal to 1, except at two points, for example. Or we would have b equal 1, except at two faces. So why 2 and not 1? Why would I do one at everywhere except at two points or except at two faces? Why not except at one face? Or? Because they, uh, they one. That's right. 
because like we said before, the product of everyone is one, so it does, so it, I need at least pairs. Okay, so how do we construct an operator that is equal to one everywhere except at two possible points? So let me do it. So let's consider our lattice. I'm still going to draw it as the torus, but for this part of the presentation, it really doesn't matter, the topology, because <coughs> we are going to be in the bulk. And now, suppose I want that for this face, and say this face here, the constraint is not satisfied, but everywhere else it is. Well, that's easy. That's what we were starting to do here, right? Where we were doing this, and it was almost OK, except at the first and the last edge. Right? That's and we kept going because we wanted to make sure it was good everywhere. That's why we needed to close. But if we are OK with it failing at two points, we just repeat this. So all I need to do is take a point and construct, construct a string that connects this face with this face. This clearly will have now the property where if I multiply, the, if I act with this operator, I call it x. It depends on this path, let's call this path t. It's an x of t. It's an open path now. But if I construct this path, connecting these two faces, and I act with this on the vacuum, doesn't matter which one, but let's always choose 0, 0 now. This will describe the state with two excitations, one here and one here. Okay. Notice why I have the right to do this. Here, I put the excitations here and I ignore the path. Why can I do it? Because you see that if I had chosen a different path, for example this, the difference between the two paths is a bunch of A operations that is equal to 1. For the same reason as before, these paths are topological. So it's important that they are there, but where you put them is not important. And so this defines a state with these excitations like this. And now, you could imagine, so okay, there is a string between them, but it doesn't matter the precise location. And similarly, we can define states where we would have now that the condition is okay everywhere except, for example, at this, uh, at this uh, point and this point for A, that would be another type of particle. How would I uh, realize this? By connecting them by a line like this of sigma z. And so this would define some line z of t prime. And this would define a state where I have my two particles with another type of string connecting between the two. So these could be particles that I could imagine manipulating in my experiment. I have my lattice, I have my two particles. I could imagine some laser moving this particle and moving these particles around. This would be a very useful way of implementing those operators. Because notice that if I take these particles and move them to become a full cycle, right? if I move these particles experimentally, like I said, to move them from being close to being very far away, this is nothing but these operators that I had before. For example, this would be Z2. Right? So if, I have, if I'm capable of manipulating these particles, I can construct these particles by taking them, growing them, taking it all the way around, and annihilating them. This is Z2. Take two of them, go like this, and annihilate them like this, a particle type X, that would be X2. So I could do these manipulations locally by creating these particles, moving them around, carrying them and letting them annihilate. This would be acting, creating and acting with this operator. And so, it's the existence of these particles 
that are somehow responsible for this model having topological order, or having this Z's and X's that have a nice topology. So there should be something local about these particles that indicates that they are kind of special. And to ask question about what's special about a particle, let's study what happens when I carry these particles around each other. And we will see that these particles, they are not fermions or bosons, they are anions. So let's suppose I take a particle that is, for example, one particle like this. <coughs> and I have a particle of this other type, like this. And now I want to take this particle and carry it around this particle here and then bring it back to the same position. So in equations, what do I want to do? I start with my yellow state. My yellow state was some um, Z operator acting on the vacuum. Then uh, I have my operator, which I act with an X operator. But now I want to add an extra let me write like this so I have my X particle then I construct my Z particle and now I would like to add an extra X contour for this contour C extra okay and I want to compare this state with what was before this was the initial state and this now is the final state and the claim is that the final state is minus the initial state meaning that I took this particle I carried it around another particle and I picked a minus sign so let's see why this is true this is true because of the following that if you act with this operator here you measure the spins here if you act with this contour twice, you do nothing. But if you act with the contour once, you split all the spins along the contour, and so you change the value of sigma z. So if I multiply here by xc, xc, this is identity. This xc conjugating sigma z flips to minus z, like we said before now. And so we get an extra minus sign. And then the xc that survived here, doesn't matter because xc times x or just x give the same thing because x is topological. So this operation, this contour, or this contour that ends on the same thing gives the same acting on the vector. So this is true. And so we get a particle that I carry. One particle, I don't swap them. That's what a fermion would be. I, don't, I just carry one particle alone and I carry it around and I pick a minus sign. So that's what's called an anion. This is not usual fact that you get this minus sign thing. So normally it would always be plus one for a fermion or a boson. And so this minus sign is what's called an anion. So it's the fact that this microscopic model locally, the fact that the particles have this non-trivial breathing that you carry them around and you pick these minus signs, it allows you automatically to say that now if I do it globally by carrying the particles around cycles and annihilating them, that will define operators that will anti commute and have an anti trivial algebra. And that will allow me to do quantum computation. So, the underlying reason why we can realize quantum computation is, in, at the end of the day, because of the existence of anionic excitations. And, uh, and now that we understand that these particles are there, we understand what perturbations do. Before, we create particles, okay, and if the model has now some perturbation, these excitations can start moving, this end wise. So now you could imagine, you do a perturbation, you create, you create an anion anti anion pair. And now this anion anti anion pair, they travel, 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 until they annihilate again. And in doing this, they will explore the topology of the manifold. And what will it produce? It will produce, they have to go around and annihilate, so it produces exponential minus the, whatever the mass is generated for this excitation, times the length of the minimal cycle. 
So that would be the field theory re explanation directly in the continuum of why we would get this uh, uh, exponential suppression. It is just that the theories are gap, but they are anions. So you get an exponential effect, and this exponential effect measures the topological charge along the various cycles of the torus in an untrivial way. <coughs> Then you ask, okay, but this is a bit limited. I only constructed sigma z and sigma x. This doesn't allow me to do all possible logical gates. I want to do something more. I don't like the fact that these anions are what's called the billion anions that I carry it around, I just get a minus. I carry it around, I get plus one again. It's just z2, it's very boring. I would like to have some kind of nanobillion group that I carry particles around and I start getting some matrix structure. That's what the second part of the paper does, it's to explain how do I generalize this structure? Instead of having just spins up and down, coupled in this trivial way, how would I go about evaluating the math so that at the end of the day, the anions are nanobillion and we can generate, really, we can get a universal quantum computer that does what the most powerful quantum computer could give. He also discusses how experimentally in practice we would go about creating these genus G surfaces and he points out some obstacles. But then this paper was really a breakthrough in the field of quantum computation, it seems, where they po where you see it's a very, very simple model, very robust, and of course it opens the, uh, the, the door to people trying other deformations, other models, uh, to uh, <coughs> really checking on the computer, see perturbing and understanding, uh, uh, and starting to characterize what could be the other models like this. This is just one example, but it, uh, my understanding was that it was really a very original idea of introducing the Hamiltonian like this. It was, so it's really a beautiful paper. Okay, so that's it. So I will turn this off. It's already red, so I'm not sure if it was already recording it yet. But uh, so this was the paper. I swapped a little bit the order of things. I don't know if you know this, but I hope it was clear. So let's randomize who is presenting uh, next week. We don't need to randomize if there are volunteers, if people want to present. So there are some people that I would like to have present. Uh, there are some people that I don't want to have present unless they really insist. No, but even if they insist, at least next week I don't want. So I think uh, Rodrigo and uh, Dennis, uh, I think uh, you, you are very good already, so you won't need to present more. <coughs> I would like, I have marked here, a few sheets that I would like, well, Rodrigo only presented twice, I believe, Rodrigo Yarga, so I think it would be nice if he would present. So, let me see where it is. Yeah, so I, I have five people that I want to hear, Rianne, Gabriel, Rodrigo Yarga, and Sisi. I told you that next week will be traveling, so I need to do this. Okay. So, Leandro will do it this week. Then we have Gabriel, Rodrigo, Francis, Juan. A piece four. Uh, and then, uh, next week, I have Alan, Juan, or Francisco, and Egan. So I would say that I would like Leandro, Gabriel, and Rodrigo to present. Rodrigo Aguiar. Leandro, Gabriel, and Rodrigo Aguiar. Plus either Francisco or uh, João. Do you guys agree? Is it okay? So now we just need to start with Francisco or João. So do you have a preference? Francisco, would you present this or do you prefer? I mean, I think I know less ADSUT than to the better. So if you have to choose, you can choose. If you prefer this, then you can choose. Okay. So. So then the 